Hey, good morning, Rev City. You can be seated. All right, if you got your Bible with you this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 10. And just be patient. We'll get there here in a moment. Allow me to catch up to speed, recap a few things, because I really believe that they're important to touch on. How many know we can hear a good message and go away unchanged if we don't pull it into our life and begin to apply it to our lives? Amen? And so allow me to recap some things. We're in our series, Heart for the Kingdom. And the the primary mission, motivation, and message of Jesus was the kingdom of God. And twice he used the word church, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. A hundred and six times he used the word for kingdom, the Greek word, basileia. His message, his motivation, his ministry was all about the kingdom of God. Twice he said church, which is the Greek word ecclesia, which means ones called out and called together for a purpose. And that's you and me. We've been called out. Come on, aren't you grateful God called you out of your old life? He didn't just call you out of your own life to get you to heaven. That's powerful enough. He called you out of your own life for a purpose. And the purpose for which we have been called together, the ecclesia of Christ, is to further and advance the kingdom of God in the hearts of people and in our churches and in our city to reveal the kingdom of God. Listen, this mattered to Jesus. 106 times. I mean, his mission, his motivation, his message, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. He did not come to build an organization or a denomination. He came to rescue sons and daughters back into a royal family, which is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Listen, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Matthew 4, verse 17. As he began his ministries, he began to preach. What did he preach? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. He was saying, think differently. Live differently. Make some changes in the way you've lived so that you can begin to obtain and access and experience and enjoy what I've come to establish. Not an organization or a denomination, but an invitation to live as part of the kingdom of God. As Jesus sent out his disciples. And that's who we are. We're disciples. We're not church members. We're disciples. Of Jesus Christ. And as he sent them out, Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, verse 2 says he sent them out to tell everyone about what? The kingdom of God. The church is who we are. The church is who we are. But furthering and advancing and building the kingdom of God is what we do. And so at Rev City, that's what we want to be. If it's important to Jesus, it's important to us. We want to be a church that builds the kingdom. We want to make disciples that make a difference. And over the past couple of weeks, I've been encouraging you with some profound truths from God's word about this kingdom that he's made you a part of, about this family that he's brought you into. And Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14 has been a key verse for us. And picking up in verse 12, it says, he, speaking of Jesus, has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Come on, somebody who's grateful that Jesus purchased your freedom and forgave your sins. And it says he's made you part of something that entitles you or enables you to receive an inheritance. That word in the Greek that that we translate enable is a legal term. And it means that he, he made possible, he paid the price, he took the steps that were required to make you part of a family. And I've encouraged you, it's not just any old family. It's a royal family. And that's important because we think about democracies, but this is a kingdom. And Jesus wasn't voted in and he cannot be voted out. He can't be recalled or impeached. Why is it important to you and to me? Because our standing in the kingdom of God is not dependent on our good behavior. It's not dependent on our popularity. And it cannot be lost because of our bad behavior. On on your worst day, God sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are part of a royal family, not because you earned it or deserved it. You never could and you never will. But Jesus came to make a way. Kingdoms are established and kingdoms are advanced through blood. And Jesus sees you, God sees you rather, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, that's good news. Isn't that good news? That that's how he sees you. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about some of the benefits of being a part of this royal family. 
This kingdom that Jesus came to preach about and to invite us to participate in. In Romans chapter 14 has been another key verse. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. In other words, he's saying it's not about religious rules and regulations. There are some things that God's word warns us about not being involved in. And there's some commandments, obviously, that he commands us to do. But he's saying, don't get caught up. They were already getting caught up in rules and regulations about what we have to do in our strength to be acceptable to God. And he's saying, that's not what this thing is about. He, he, he knew that he came and shed his blood to make us part of a family. He's saying, don't get caught up in all that stuff. He says, but rather, the kingdom of God that I'm inviting you to be a part of is about these three things, righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. And I've encouraged you that righteousness is not just about good behavior. Righteousness is about right standing with God. It's not about a behavior or a lifestyle. It's about a position. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 shows us this. It says, for he made him, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's not about good behavior. And Jesus did not come to correct bad behavior. He came to rescue sons and daughters. And make us part of a royal family. And when we begin to get this, I mean, come on, when we really begin to get this, that this is who we are, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, maybe some of the things that we've been struggling against, maybe some of the battles that we've been warring and some of the behaviors that we've been striving to see changed in our own strength will begin to change because of the weight of the understanding that we are children of the Most High God, that we are a son or a daughter of the King, and not just any King, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we begin to understand, this is who I am. This is not just what I do, it's who I am. And what, how we live begins to flow out of that deeper revelation. Listen, that thing I'm struggling with, that's, that's so far beneath the royal family, the royal position that God has established and invited me to be a part of. I'm a son, I'm a child of God. And it's not just any family, it's a royal family. And we begin to live differently. Come on, you got to get this. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he says it's righteousness, joy, and it's peace. And I've encouraged you that joy, according to the Bible, is your strength. And by the way, isn't it interesting that these three things that God's word establishes are our inheritance as part of the kingdom of God? Righteousness, joy, and peace. Are there any three things that are more under attack in your heart and your mind today? Righteousness, position, identity. There, there's an attack. There's people are confused about their identity. Joy and peace. People are riddled with and gripped with anxiety and fear. Is it any wonder that the very things that Jesus came and said, this is what I'm inviting you to have and to participate in and to receive through me, not because you earn it or deserve it, but just because of who you are in me. Righteousness, right standing with God, joy that transcends happiness and circumstances and peace that's abiding and transcends circumstances. That's what I'm giving to you. Is it any wonder that those things are under such attack? And the Bible says that joy is your spiritual strength, that, that, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I've encouraged us that when we allow the enemy to create circumstances or interruptions or, or disappointments that cause us to lay down our strength, we're op or lay down our joy, rather, we're operating in a weakened condition. God intends for you to operate in joy and peace. That part of the kingdom inheritance that Colossians says that we have is peace. And Jesus said it this way, John 14, verse 27. He said, peace, I leave with you. Like, like an inheritance, like, 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 like you were left something as, as part of an inheritance. He said that. He said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In other words, he's saying, I came and I purchased something. I accrued something. I saved up something. And now I'm leaving it to you. Not because of what you do, but because of who you are to me. and Because of who I am to you. The kingdom of God is not a matter of rules and regulations, of eating and drinking. It's righteousness, joy, and peace. Come on, you got to get this in your heart in a way that goes beyond your head. And if you do, I'm just telling you, watch out. It'll change the way that you live. Come on, we ought to just say this together. I am the righteousness of God. We ought to just say this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Say it. I have the peace of Christ. That guards my heart and my mind 
in Christ Jesus. Come on, those are good declarations to make this morning. That's, that's what you have access to as part of the kingdom of God. In this series, we're also establishing some vision into the life and into the culture of our church. And I've shared with you that, that as elders, we began just sensing and hearing the Lord speak to us as we were walking through all the processes and the prayer and the planning that was required to, to prepare to renovate our facility and then to see it through. And the Lord began just challenging us and speaking to us that in the midst of, of all the ongoing ministries and activities that we are to be about as a church, that this renovation was not the first or the last time that he would call us to faith for something that in the midst of doing all the things that we are doing in an ongoing way, having worship services together like we're experiencing today, and kids ministry that's hopefully bringing those kids into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that helps them to know their God and know his word and begin to prepare themselves to be world changers for Jesus and and, and youth ministry and life groups and, and, and marriage counseling and all the things that we're about right now. The Lord said, it's not the first or the last time I'm going to call you in the middle of all those things to some kind of a step of faith that you'll have to respond to to advance and to further the kingdom of God. We began to say, Lord, help us with that. How would we do that? He began to speak to us about this message, about his heart for us to be a church that wants to build the kingdom. And so Heart for the Kingdom is going to be installed into the culture of our church, and here's what it's going to be like. Every year, we're going to, as leaders, put our ear towards heaven and say, Lord, in the midst of everything that you've done and all that we already have to be grateful for, what's next for us? Because you've called us to live by faith, and we believe that we're to be a church that's advancing the kingdom of God, and that we're thankful and we're grateful for everything that you've done and all the lives that have already been changed, but until every person in Lawrence, Kansas, and the surrounding region knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, we're going to have an aggressive vision and an aggressive mentality to go and to build the kingdom and advance the kingdom. What would you have us to believe for in this coming season? Are you calling us to raise up a leadership team and plan another church? Are you calling us to maybe go and reach into Topeka and shine the light of Jesus into Topeka or maybe plan a church campus in Kansas City or wherever God calls us to, to go and to, to plant something? Would you call us maybe to go to the other side of Lawrence and purchase a building and build a benevolence center that helps, to, helps us as a church family to rally together and unite together? to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked and to bring the message of hope to Jesus and to bring the discipleship message of the, the Bible into their life so that they begin to be prepared to break free of some things, some of the lies of the enemy that have maybe held them back and hindered them from walking in the abundant life of Jesus Christ. Lord, those are the kind of things that we're expecting you to call us to through heart for the kingdom. And then as your pastor, I'm going to come to you as our church family and I'm going to say, here's what we believe that God is calling us to believe for. And here's what it's going to take of us. It's going to require us to be willing to show up and serve at that benevolence center and volunteer to sort the food and to sort the clothing and prepare the atmosphere and be on site and be present to receive people, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to them when they show up longing and desperate for just a material need to be met, but us knowing that what really needs to happen is they need to drink of a living water that will cause them to never thirst again, whose name is Jesus. It's going to require us to live differently. It's going to require us to think differently. It's going to happen by God's grace, but it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to require us as a church family to say yes to God. And, and, and I've said this before, but it bears repeating. You, God will use any church that just is willing to say yes to Jesus. Where there's a need, God, yes, we'll go. Where, where, where there's a challenge, yes, we'll step in, Lord. Just, say, just Lord, just show us and grace us and just help us, God. And we'll go and we'll do whatever it is that you call us to do. It's going to require us. If we want to be a church that builds the kingdom, if we want to be a church that, that is about a broader impact, and here's what that's about, reaching more people. Jesus is about people. He's about, he's about reaching people who are lost and who are hurting and bringing them back into a relationship. If we want to be that kind of a church, it's going to require us to live differently and think differently. Did I, did I tell you to go to Matthew chapter 10? Before we re get into God's word, let's pray and let's invite the Lord to speak to us and minister to us this morning. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together here in this place as your people, Lord. And thank you for this invitation that you're giving us to be a church that builds God's kingdom. And Lord, I thank you for every man, every woman, every marriage that's represented here, every young person that's here, God. And 
And I thank you that you know, Lord, you know every circumstance, you know every situation, you know every need, you know every challenge, and you know every victory, God. And we just thank you, Lord, that your heart today, God, is to come and to strengthen us as your people. And come on, man of God, woman of God, right where you sit this morning, would you just open your heart up and would you invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning? Would you invite the Lord to touch your heart this morning? Would you invite the Lord to strengthen you this morning and equip you to be and become more of the man of God? Come on, the man of courage and faith, more of the woman of God, the woman of destiny and purpose that Jesus came to make possible for you to be and to become. Come on, just ask him this morning. Lord, speak to me. Lord, strengthen me. Lord, heal me. Lord, restore me in any area where I need that this morning. And we thank you in advance, God, that that's exactly what you'll do because your heart is so good for us as your people. And we thank you in advance for the way that you're going to speak to us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name and all of God's precious people said, amen, amen, amen. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and verse 8. And you might recognize the first part of it because it says, as you go, Verse 7, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is Jesus' command to you and to I as disciples. And he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. And then catch this, freely you have received, freely give. If we're going to be a church that believes that we're going to call, be called to broader impact in building the kingdom, there's some things that we're going to have to be about. And last week I challenged us with the message of servanthood. That God's called us. One of the things that we'll have to say yes to is showing up and serving. And I, and I use that analogy. I had that, that, that dish towel that was supposed to be like a linen napkin. And I, I, put it, I tucked it in right here like I was pulling myself up to a table to consume. And I said, for many years, the church was seeker sensitive and seeker friendly. And don't get me wrong, we want to be about reaching the lost. But for many years, we catered the message to what people wanted to hear instead of what they needed to hear. And we did not do people any favors. And to be a church that builds the kingdom, we've got to be, restore the message of what it means to daily take up our cross and crucify our lives and live not for ourselves, but for the glory of Jesus and for the blessing of others. That God's called us to be servants, that we're most like God when we serve and give our lives away. And right here in this verse, we see that the advancing of God's kingdom is tied to being generous. He says, freely you've received. Now freely you should give. Giving is associated with advancing the kingdom. One of the, the values of Rev City Church, if you look in our vision book, our values book, is that we want to be a culture of generosity. And here's what it says in that vision book. I'm reading directly from it. It says, we live to give. Giving is a Christ-like lifestyle. We generously give, catch this, forgiveness, mercy, grace, love, time, Whatever is needed to reveal Jesus to others. Regarding finances, which is what we typically think of first when a preacher starts to talk about giving, we faithfully tithe as the starting point for extravagantly supporting and building God's kingdom through our local church. We live to give, and giving is about far more than money. We're called to be, a, to be a generous people. We're called to give away everything that Jesus has given us so freely. Whatever, we say it right there, whatever is needed to reveal Jesus in that moment, we want to be generous with mercy, with compassion, with understanding, with forgiveness, with the second chance, with hope. Whatever it is that God has put in our heart and given us so freely, we want to go and just say, Lord, you've freely given it to me and I didn't deserve it. Now my responsibility is to look and see who am I called to give it away to today. We desire to be a generous culture. Did you know, did you know that giving is the verb of the Bible? And you might think, well, Pastor T, I don't know, maybe it's love. But I want you to think about something this morning. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave. If Jesus had just, if God had just loved us but been unwilling to give, where would we be? He loved and so he gave. Giving is the verb of the Bible, and Jesus, whom the Father gave, came as this amazing example of radical generosity and sacrifice that carried with it the anointing and the power of God to change lives. And I'm just telling you, when we as a church embrace this message, and listen, you're a giving church and you're a generous church. 
but in an even deeper way, a fresh way, a new commitment, a, 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 another commitment to say, Lord, we're re-upping to be this kind of people, or, or we're re-upping to say, Lord, to do the things that you're calling us to do, we're willing to serve and be generous. I just believe that there's a fragrance that it invites into the church. There, there's an anointing that's present. When we are not here for ourselves, we show up in this place and say, Lord, what can I give away today? Giving is the verb of the Bible, and we're called to be a giving people, a culture of generosity. You see, churches and Christians that debate and wrangle over giving, they miss the point, and especially over giving the tithe. I mean, is it, is it, is it in the New Testament? Am I called to tithe? Is it 10%? And what's the percentage? And listen, we'll get into that some in the, in the following few weeks, and there are some powerful principles associated with what Jesus uh, uh, um, refers to as the tithe. In the New Testament, Jesus said in red letters, you should tithe. But when we get caught up with that, we miss the entire point that God has called us to live generously. It's not just 10% that belongs to him. Everything that we have belongs to him. A hundred percent of what I have, I have by his grace and his grace only. And when I begin to see this and when I begin to embrace a, 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 the call to live generously, giving 10% to my church becomes easy. It's the starting point of generosity for me. We're called to be a generous people when our hearts are on fire for Jesus when we realize that building the kingdom is the only thing we do that has a lasting impact tithing becomes an easy starting point for living generously to build the kingdom fortunately just like many areas that are important in our life I say it all the time but you got to see that it's true anywhere where there's power and potential and promise you better expect the enemy to come and oppose it or like in this instance bring controversy around it and it's time for the church to once again not shrink back from challenging people to a life of discipleship and challenging people from a life of giving our lives away and serving others with our lives and to a life of generosity, giving anything and everything that we have that answers a need and meets a need for the glory of Jesus and to advance the kingdom of God. We're called to make disciples, not church members. And we're on a mission to change a city, not fill a room with people. And for us to be about that, we're going to have to live this life. We're going to have to embrace this life. And can I tell you, the, the church that has shrunk back from challenging people to this, to, to giving away our lives and to living generously, we haven't done anyone any favors. Is it possible that we're getting the results that we're getting in some other areas of our life because we've laid down this message that challenges us to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ and to live in the way that he came to model for us to live? Here's the thing, nothing works like the word of God. And I believe that as we return and as this message is restored to this pulpit and other pulpits across our land, as pastors begin to once again challenge people that we're not just called to be believers in Jesus, but we're called to be disciples of Jesus. We're called to go and live the way that he lived. And we're called to make a difference in the way that he's called us to make. I believe that we will see the power and the presence of God return to the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe that it's what, is, it's what will be required for many people to begin to see there's something different about those people. That there's a joy, there's a peace that they have, and there's something changes when they show up on the scene. Something changes when they show up in the budget meeting. Something changes when they show up at work. Something changes. There's something that's different about them. Because they don't just hear the words that we preach, but they see the way that we live. And we're called to be generous. We're called to be servants. And generosity goes way beyond money. It goes way beyond money. Listen, if, if we would just preach more about generosity, about becoming generous, finances in the church would take care of themselves. God's called us to be generous. Whatever it takes. We were so intentional when we wrote that family value. Whatever it takes, if it's love, if it's forgiveness, if it's mercy, if it's compassion, whatever it takes to reveal Jesus in that moment, that's what we want to be generous with. But it's also about our finances. And for God to use us to do some of the things that he's going to call us to do, we're going to have to be a generous people in the area of our finances. And, you know, we need the right heart towards money. And we need the blessing of God in this area. And the blessing of God is found in the word of God. And there are principles in God's word that lead to provision and protection from God's hand. And so we've got to get into God's word. Come on, as disciples of Jesus, don't we want to hear and know what his word has to say about every area of life and be willing to respond to what his word says and be willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to, th to repent and think differently and begin to live that way because your kingdom is at hand? 
But it's so important to capture this message. Every area of your life will be impacted. And did you know that they say research has proven time and time and time and time again that conflict over finances is the number one indicator of future divorce and marriage? Study after study after study have shown And here's the point, that we need God's blessing on this area in our life. And and, and I I looked it up in just a few studies. One of them was close to home from K-State. And a lady named Sonia Britt at K-State. Come on, shout out to Sonia if you're out there in Manhattan, beautiful Manhattan, Kansas. And here's what she said in her research, and I'm quoting her. Arguments about money are by far the top predictor of divorce, Britt said. It's not children, sex, in-laws, or anything else. It's money for both men and women women. Utah State University did a study, a lengthy study with many, many people a part of it, and it it came up with this result. Couples with weekly occurrences of financial disagreement were 160% more likely to divorce. Listen, in this area, we need the blessing of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Turn back to Matthew chapter 6. Giving us this, this lifestyle, this culture of generosity is not about money. It's about our hearts. It's about our hearts. And watch what Jesus said. Verse 19, Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And isn't it interesting that the way that Jesus says that, the order of which he says it? And then the 9 o'clock service, I actually messed it up. And when I read that, I read, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. And it was a perfect illustration because it was the point I was about to make, that so many times you hear that, that scripture quoted, and they quote it the opposite way of what Jesus said. He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And most of us tend to think where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But it's really true. Just think about this. When you buy a share of a stock, just say that you bought a share of Tesla, you didn't care what the stock price was yesterday, but now that you are invested in that stock, you are checking the price. Your treasure has become invested in something, and because your treasure is now invested in something, now your heart is interested in the matter. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Turn to Luke chapter 6, and we're going to end right here. Giving is about the heart. A culture of generosity is about the heart. And I want you to just listen to the words of this passage and just allow it to to resonate in your heart and allow, allow it to challenge you in every area of your life. Am I generous? Am I doing what Jesus said to do that would reveal the kingdom to freely give? that which he has freely given to me. And look what it says here, Luke chapter 6, verse 27. And it says, but to you who are listening, I say. And first, I just want to say, are we listening to God? Listen this morning. There is a difference between hearing and listening. Are you listening? What, Lord, what are you speaking to me this morning? What area of my life are you calling me to become generous in? To begin to freely give something that you've freely given to me, whether that's love or forgiveness or a second chance. And he says, but to those who are listening, I say, listen to these things that he challenges us with. These are challenging statements. He says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you. I mean, these are tough statements. It says, if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them to do to you. Listen, that's the golden rule. And we, sometimes we, we're comfortable with that, but the pretext are all those things that can be challenging and difficult to do in real life and in real terms. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, from, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. 
But then he says, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Verse 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. In other words, he's saying, what, what, what you give, you're going to receive. What you give, you're going to receive. And, and watch, here he just, he says it. He says, give and it will be given to you. And we tend to think about this, this passage right here in the context of money. And it applies to our money. But you can see clearly here, it was never about money. And he says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And the context was never money. The context is give freely the things that I've given to you. I, I, I don't judge you. I don't condemn you. There's no condemnation in Christ. I forgive you. I love you in spite of your weaknesses, your frailties, and your, your shortcomings. I've given you a second chance, a new life, a fresh start. It's the message of the gospel and the hope of the cross of Jesus Christ. He's saying those things I've freely given you, and now I'm calling you to be a generous people. And when we are generous with the things that God has given us freely, the kingdom of God is advanced. Would you stand to your feet this morning? And I want to pray over you, and I want you to prepare yourself to pray and to ask the Lord, Lord, what are you speaking to me? What area of my life is there some place where you've freely given something to me that I need to now give to someone else? And one of the key areas that I was preparing for this message and to lead this moment right here was the area of unforgiveness. That there are many people who freely, I mean, Jesus has forgiven you as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says that your sins are as deep as the ocean floor. Counted no more. Freely you've received. And now the call of God is to freely give. Here's the thing. It can be challenging. It can be difficult. It's easier to say than it is to do. Because, Pastor T, if you only knew, they really said that thing. They really did that thing. They really hurt me in this way. And I want to encourage you with the profound truth. When you forgive someone, it does not make them right. It simply makes you free. It doesn't justify. It doesn't nullify. The real thing that they might have said or done to you that hurt you in a deep way. But freely you've received freely given. I just believe that there's some people here that are harboring a, a grudge of unforgiveness, and today is the day of freedom and salvation for you. Today is the day that God stirs. A message about generosity stirs the ability and the grace from God and from heaven to once and for all say, God, that thing that they said or they did to me that was a real thing that created real harm and real pain in my life. Today, I realize that you've extended real forgiveness to me, and my responsibility is to forgive them freely I've received, freely I give. I said, what, what, I normally don't do this. I really don't. But every head bowed, every eye closed, because this is just such a sensitive private matter. If that's you this morning, there's an area of unforgiveness towards someone in your life. And today you want to apprehend the grace to not in your own strength, but in the grace of Jesus Christ to extend forgiveness in a way that, again, doesn't make them right, but makes you free. If that's you this morning, I just want you to lift your hand. Hands going up all over this room. Mm, I didn't know. I didn't know how many people would respond. My hands going up all over this room. And you, you, you. Can, it's up to you. You can leave your hand up or you can put it down. But I want to want you to allow me to pray for you. And right where you are, I want you to begin to just forgive them. Right there in your heart, I want you to just begin to express it. There's faith comes by hearing, and you need to hear yourself, even if it's under your voice, just saying, "Lord, I forgive them. I release them. I bless them in the name of Jesus." Lord, we recognize that we have been forgiven. Oh, my goodness. I mean, if you only knew half of what I've been forgiven of. And, Lord, we're so thankful. We're so grateful. And, Lord, even though some of these situations, real hurt, real pain, real things that were done or said to us, we thank you today that your call is to freely give in a generous way what we've freely received. And so we forgive them right now in the name of Jesus. We bless them right now in the name of Jesus. We release them right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for their good right now in the name of Jesus. And as we do that in faith, even if you have to do it this morning, in faith, come on, you're called to live by faith and not by your emotions or your sight. 
And Lord, we thank you, even if we're doing it today by faith, I thank you for what's transpiring in the hearts of every man and woman and young person who's extending forgiveness right now. There's freedom that's coming right now in the name of Jesus. There's a reward of freedom that's coming right now in the name of Jesus. You're, you're relinquishing the right that that thing had to consume your emotions and your energy right now in Jesus' mighty name. And I thank you, Lord, that there's going to be some fresh joy and there's going to be fresh peace that's restored to people because of the power of this step of faith right now, forgiving someone who really did something harmful to us in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for relationships, that there's a process that's being set into motion right now because of the spiritual power of this forgiveness in faith is going to usher in some practical restoration and reconciliation in relationships, Lord. And we just trust you for that, God, your timing and your way in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right there, just, just begin to just give thanks. Just say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. And thank you, Lord, for gracing me to forgive them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then before we move on and worship God, one more thing, one more opportunity to raise your hand and respond to the message this morning. And that's the opportunity. It's the most important thing that we do every Sunday, and it's to give you the opportunity to respond to Jesus and his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy if today you find yourself far from God. And maybe you once were close to God, maybe you grew up in the church and you would be this morning what the Bible refers to as a prodigal son or daughter. Your life got busy and things happened and you've looked up and you've drifted from your relationship with God. If that's you this morning. We believe that you're not here by accident. You are here because of the heart of a good father who is calling you back home and he's longing for you to just take one step towards him and he comes running and embracing you back into his loving arms. And if that's you or maybe this morning you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, today's the day. Today's the day. Do not delay. You're not responding to me. You're responding to God. If that's you, either one of those situations or anywhere in between, do not delay. Lift your hand high towards heaven right now and say, that's me. Lift your hand high towards heaven and say, that's me, Pastor T. I'm coming home. I'm coming home to that royal family. I'm coming home to be the daughter of the king, the daughter of God that I was created to be. And thank you, Lord, for these precious young women, Lord. Thank you, God, for the, the destiny that they are being reconnected to right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for what's transpiring in their lives, Lord. Thank you that there, this is more than a hand that's being lifted towards heaven. This is a heart that's turning back towards a heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for old things being washed away, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sin and guilt and shame and condemnation being washed away by the power of your love that was, that was evidence to us at the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. One more moment if there's anyone to just respond and say, I, I'm coming home to Jesus this morning. One more moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Come on, we're going to pray this prayer with you, those of you who raised your hands. And we do it for a couple reasons. We do it to just come alongside you and just quickly begin to just in some small way show you and indicate to you that we want to come alongside you as a spiritual family and help you begin to grow in your faith in Jesus. And two, we do it because it reminds us that we never graduate from grace. We might be growing in our faith, but we still need Jesus today as bad as we did yesterday. Amen. So come on, church, with the many precious people who lifted their hands in response to Jesus this morning. Let's pray this with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. I give you that life. I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. And come on, someone ought to celebrate with these precious people this morning. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's worship him.